Hello, my friends. Stay a while and listen. It's Q here from Retro Q Gaming, and I want to take you back in time. And despite going so far back in time, there was still things that we have to this day very prevalent, mainly the console wars, something that has existed through generation to generation of console over the years. From new companies rising to old companies fading into obscurity. From vicious ad campaigns to the weirdest of celebrity endorsements. From Mode 7 to Blast Processing, we are going to take a look through the years at the console wars. We're going to see how they played out on this side of the world, and how I persevered, how I survived, and what side I chose, and how that played out for me. Over the next couple of videos, we'll see how all this went. But for now, let's take a look at the sixth console generation and boy oh boy is this video probably going to be a long one because we have so much to get through here and there is so much in this one in this console generation that really needs to be talked about in my opinion it's probably the most interesting console generation interesting is the key word to use there obviously the super nintendo is the best console of all time but you'll see why now in a minute why it's so interesting we'll we'll touch on that actually now in a second but there's a whole 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 lot of stuff we have to go through so in this console generation what are we talking about well the sixth console generation had four consoles in it that's right four consoles you may remember a little while back in previous generations there was really only two or maybe possibly two or three to an extent and most recently in the previous generation the fifth gen we had a new face to the game a new challenger appeared that of course being sony and they came in big and they completely dominated that generation. They absolutely capitalized on all of Nintendo's failings of that generation, not to mention Sega falling flat on their face. So what could Sony do going forward with the success of the PlayStation 1? Well, we all know the PlayStation 2. Now there's so much we could say about the PlayStation 2, which we will, of course, in due time. But before we do that, let's look at the rest of the faces in the game. We had Sega's own lovable Dreamcast, which is, well, kind of ill-fated at this point. A decent console, of course, but naturally we all know that this was Sega's last proper official piece of hardware. And it, they've just become a software company ever since, mainly because of several different things when it came to how the Sega brand and their consoles and all was handled, mostly after the Mega Drive onwards, to be honest. But we'll get into detail about the Dreamcast a little bit later. Of course, we have Nintendo's offering, the GameCube, still a little bit behind the times, as is Nintendo, because while all their competitors, or at least the majority of them, were using proper DVD-style discs, both single and dual there, Nintendo finally making the transition to optical media opted for DVD-1 discs. Again, so much we can talk about when we do get to the GameCube a little bit later in this video. But last up, we'll talk about the new face in this game. Previously, we had Sony joining the fight, but now, in the 6th gen, we have someone new again leading us to the four consoles. This one, of course, being the big boy, the big daddy, with so much money and technical experience under their belt. That's right, we have Microsoft coming in with the Xbox. Of course, nowadays, that will be known as the OG Xbox or the Xbox 180 or the original Xbox, whatever you want to call it. They came in big. They came in hard. They may not have won, but they did a damn good job to come in second, especially on their first try against industry veterans like Nintendo and Sega. Now, let's move on for the rest of this video. Of course, naturally, you may have to forgive one or two dates in this video for multiple reasons. One... I'm going off European dates. Like I said, this applies to Europe and specifically how I dealt with all of this going forward and going through and living this whole thing. Number two, this was almost 20 years ago. I'm bound to get one or two things wrong at this point. At least one or two minor details like that. So you'll have to bear with me on that front. But as I know it, the Sega Dreamcast was the first out of the gate. Everyone was feeling kind of bored and samey and whatnot about the whole Sony PlayStation and the Nintendo 64. Of course, no one even factored in the Sega Saturn at that point. But then, out of nowhere, Sega looked to be coming back big and coming back hard. Because they had a new console coming out. It could do proper quality 3D graphics. No quadrilaterals here. Proper quality polygons. It looked to be a large leap ahead. Which is something I actually forgot to talk about earlier in this video at the start of it. 
even though I did say this is probably the most interesting generation, this is what I actually consider the last proper top quality generation. Of course, in the most recent ones, there have been some extremely good games, but the 6th gen is where the top quality masterpiece level, at least on a consistent basis, stopped. And also feels like where innovation, both visually and graphically and whatnot, kind of stagnated and became diminishing returns. Sure, the jump from the Super Nintendo to the PS1 and N64 was great, but with the power of these consoles, it feels like they really could do it and refine it properly, get it to that quality level to be truly effective. I'm sure, of course, we've come a long way since then, but this felt like the real last innovation graphically, if you will. Anyway, that's beside the point and a little bit out of place in, in this video, or, or at least at this time frame. So back to where we were. The Sega Dreamcast, since this was the first bad boy we knew, the first new big thing, naturally, we all wanted it. And despite the Sega Dreamcast going on to sell less than 10 million units, becoming so much of a flop essentially, that it got Sega to move out of the hardware market and has almost only been replicated in sales numbers wise by something as so poor as the Wii U to this day. You would still think the Dreamcast was kind of a niche product, but that wasn't the case over here. Pretty much everyone I knew had a Sega Dreamcast. I had a Dreamcast, pretty much all my friends had a Dreamcast, I think there was two of them that didn't. But that was dwarfed by the dozens of us that did. And the beautiful thing about that, back then, is when you were still in school, you had all these games. Of course, we swapped games. We lent games, we borrowed games, we did all of this good shit. And we all remember what the Dreamcast was known for. The Dreamcast could do proper arcade quality ports. It could do quality arcade games that Sega was known for, as well as fateful arcade ports that other companies were known for. Which leads us to one other big thing as well. This was the last proper generation where it felt like a lot of the companies were, a lot of the third party developers I should say, were actually properly experimenting with every single console in the likes of their exclusivity and putting, say, new entries in, in significant franchises onto these platforms. A perfect example of this is Resident Evil Code Veronica, originally a Dreamcast exclusive game. Yes, of course, it was later eventually ported for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube, but at the same time, you had Capcom releasing the Resident Evil remake exclusively on GameCube, Resident Evil Zero exclusively on GameCube, and Resident Evil 4 originally exclusively on GameCube. The last one, of course, would eventually receive a port to the PlayStation 2. But when you think about it, this was from Capcom, a company who had developed the series, Resident Evil. They had put out four games, three mainline ones, and then, well, Gun Survivor. Originally on a super successful PlayStation, the Sony console of the previous generation, now moving away and branching out, releasing an exclusive mainline entry series game on a Sega console, a different one, several different ones for that matter, including a remake, the continuation of the series, and an original prequel on a different platform, and Sony only getting some weird kind of offshoot, with the likes of Gun Survivor Code Veronica and Resident Evil Outbreak File 1 and 2. Of course, not including the later ports of Code Veronica X and Resident Evil 4. But you can see why that's a pretty big deal. Stuff like that would probably very, very rarely, if at all, happen these days. And it would absolutely, definitely not involve a Nintendo console anymore. Because back then, the Dreamcast, the PlayStation 2, the Nintendo GameCube, and even the Xbox were very similar in power together. Granted, the Xbox was a decent bit ahead, but the PS2, the GameCube, and the Dreamcast were all very, very similar. Something which Nintendo has not done since to this day. All our systems since then have been significantly less powerful than the current competition. But that was the beauty of the sixth generation of console. There was so much variety, not just from the hardware manufacturers, but from third party developers. As a comparison from nowadays, let's say Resident Evil Code Veronica would now have been released on all four of those platforms, probably all announced at the same time. Probably the same with the remake, Resident Evil Zero and Resident Evil 4. There was a lot of different stuff going on back then. And it led to some great stuff. We can all remember such amazing games on the Dreamcast. How much time and an effort and investment we put into these games. Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, Power Stone 1 and 2, Resident Evil Code Veronica, Choo Choo Rocket, the advent of online gaming, at least on consoles. Which we'll get to in more detail in this video. And let's of course never forget the masterpiece of Shemu 1 and 2. 
And that's of course even looking over some smaller games like Grandia 2, Time Stock, Blue Stinger, Headhunter, Fantasy Star Online, and the list goes on. And of course, as an ever slight aside, the fact that you could actually just download and burn Dreamcast games onto a regular CD with no modding, no flashing, no software, no anything, opened up the entire library. Just to give you a couple of little extra tidbits from kind of personal experience when it came to the Dreamcast, I remember when myself and one of my friends were downloading all sorts of games for Dreamcast because we found out we could do it, and then suddenly... After about 10 different versions of Street Fighter 2 from the previous stuff we knew, there was suddenly a Street Fighter 3. Not a Street Fighter 2 Part 3, not a Street Fighter 2 Super Mega Ultra Death March Edition, but an actual Street Fighter 3. Naturally, of course, we had to play this, and it completely blew our mind. Some other badass, amazing, notable stuff from that era... Online gaming. We'll get to more about that on, say, mostly the Xbox, and even a little bit on the GameCube. But I remember my first online game, on a console at least, was Choo Choo Rocket, a game that Sega would send out to you for free for signing up for their online service, which of course was also free. And as we close out the bit for the Dreamcast, of course, naturally, as a huge Shenmue fan, and someone who has been very vocal and participated in pretty much the majority of the Saving Shemu Tweetatons and whatnot, as well as a backer of Shemu Tree on Kickstarter, to this day, one of my best friends I made because of Shenmu. I was just hanging out one day with all my friends, and then one of our other friends came over and he had some guy with him. It turns out he was his cousin, and we were all talking about games and Dreamcast games and whatnot, and then the other guy, we were talking about Shenmu, and the other guy just goes, oh, I, I have that. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then eventually we got to know each other a little bit better, and we were talking about Shenmu because I hadn't played it, and it was new, and getting Dreamcast games here was very hard. And then a little while later, maybe a couple of weeks or whatnot, he actually lent me Shenmu. So you can see why that's still a big deal. And still, to this day, we talk pretty much every day, shoot the shit, play games, go to conventions, whatever it is we need to do. Probably all because of that game. Possibly all because of that game, but I will definitely give it credit in that regard. And another one, just with how game distribution and games being finished and going gold and getting to suppliers and whatnot back then, there was a huge, huge big deal. Because me and one of my other friends, who I don't believe I've ever mentioned in a video, we were the Resident Evil guy. Resident Evil was our thing. We knew everything about everything. And he didn't have a Dreamcast. He was one of those guys who didn't. And we had a video game distributor around here. Used to be in my town, it's gone now. It was one of the wholesalers that sells at the stores. But eventually, myself and some of my other friends got to know someone who worked in there. And they would slip us games, they'd sell us them and whatnot as well. Days, weeks, or sometimes even months in advance. Hell, at one point, I even managed to get from him a copy of the new Resident Evil game. Now, because there was no real proper form of the internet and whatnot back then, this game was completely out of left field. No one knew about it because you had to wait for a magazine to release all the info once a month. This game hadn't even been announced. This of course was Resident Evil Code Veronica. And one day I got that and of course I played the shit out of it, absolutely loved it because Code Veronica is a fantastic game. And then I ran into that friend I was talking about in school a couple of days later. And he was asking me what I'd been doing. I was like, oh, I'm playing a new Resident Evil game. He's like, what are you talking about? There's no new Resident Evil game. I just looked at him with a big smile on my face and I said, you know what, come home with me after school and I'm going to fucking blow your mind because there is a new Resident Evil game. And the fun thing about it is that game, Code Veronica, wasn't due to be released for about another six months. I had that game roughly six months finished, completed and ready to go to retail stores in my possession six months or so before launch. That was a big deal. So we've droned on way, way too long about the Dreamcast at this point. So let's move on to the PlayStation 2, because that was the next one to launch, here in Europe at least. So the PlayStation 2, the PS2, I can't really call it the big black juggernaut, because, well, the OG Xbox 180 really holds that title to an extent. To an extent. In, bo in physical presence, the Xbox holds that title. Although in sales and legacy-wise, it is absolutely the case for the PlayStation 2 to hold that title. To this day, the PlayStation 2 is probably still the main console that I will accredit to bringing gaming to the mainstream, to bringing it forward, to bringing it to be popular and, like I said, mainstream in that way. 
And just to corroborate what I said on that, you have the sales numbers. The sales numbers do not lie. Over 150 million units sold of the PlayStation 2 consoles in all forms, both the, the big fat PlayStation 2 and the slimline PS2. And all of that led to the best selling games console of all time. That's right, the PS2 has the highest number of sales compared to any single platform out there when it comes to gaming short of pc of course but even to this day nothing has beat the playstation 2 and before it nothing had beat the playstation 2 the nintendo ds came close but it still could not beat the playstation 2 and who could blame it when you look at the library of games on the ps2 such amazing titles on there both landmark and just generic and niche there was so much on there for everyone the PS2 really helped the first-person shooter genre get going on consoles. Sure, of course, it was always around from way, way back in the day. But with both the controller and the graphics available on the PS2, it took a real step forward. Especially since the control scheme we know for console shooters nowadays was actually firmly developed at the end of the PS1 era thanks to one of the Aliens games. When it came to the PS2 and beyond, they could all use that as a baseline. Sure, there was one or two that used other ones, but that was firmly cemented by then. And there were so many other series as well. Final Fantasy was a big one that moved from the PlayStation 1 to proper higher quality in the PlayStation 2. Where you had Final Fantasy X, I don't care what anyone says, Final Fantasy X is fantastic. Hell, to the point where my Final Fantasy X file, at least on the PS2, is over 150 hours. With the online capabilities of those current consoles, granted it was added later to the PS2 where it was actually built in natively with the likes of the Dreamcast and the Xbox. But because of that functionality, even though it was prompted much later in the PS2's life cycle, we could get games like Final Fantasy XI, that's right, a Final Fantasy MMO, which would eventually be launched on PC and Xbox 360, and is still going to this day, although now it's only on PC with the Xbox 360 and PS2 versions shut down a few years ago. But still, to think they, they would last that long? And with the power of these consoles, not just the PS2, you had all these series, all these genres, and all these IPs maybe had been started on the previous gen or beforehand, but they now have the next step and can move forward with a higher quality experience. Let's look at Silent Hill. Silent Hill 1 is a fantastic psychological horror game. They did what they could with the PS1, but then when the PS2 came out and the power afforded to them by that, they could develop one of the finest survival horror, if not the best psychological horror game ever created with Silent Hill 2. Still to this day, this game remains a masterpiece in several regards. Even though they weren't originally native to the platform, they did receive ports later on, so I'll use them as an example. Look at Resident Evil. Even though it was such a great era where companies were actually branching out and putting different mainline entries as exclusives on different platforms, or at least originally exclusives, with the power of these consoles, again, like the PS2, we could have games like Resident Evil Code Veronica X an enhanced port of the Dreamcast original. Resident Evil 4, ported from the GameCube to the PS2. Granted, it was an inferior version of the game, but again, the overall experience was there. It was very, very similar. And the jumping quality and atmosphere and what they could do because of the environments, the graphics, the visuals, the fidelity, everything. Even the sound moved everything forward in such a phenomenal way for gamers. And of course, it would be absolutely remiss of me if I didn't mention the perfect example of every single adjective I just used, Metal Gear Solid 2. After the massive groundbreaking success of Metal Gear Solid 1 back on the PS1 and PC, Metal Gear Solid 2 really drove that forward. The fidelity of that game, the details and intricacies in that game in every way, shape and form were insane. Especially when you consider the fact that it was such an early game in that regards. Or at least it had its roots embedded so early in the PlayStation 2, to the point where a launch game, Zone of the Enders, also by Konami and Kojima, originally came at launch with a demo, a playable demo, of part of the tanker of Metal Gear Solid 2. And that was the kind of thing, the kind of stuff and style we were available to and we were looking forward and hyped for because of the increased performance of these consoles, like I said, specifically the PS2 in this case. This is what got us hyped. This is what got us excited. And stuff like this, that was why this was truly the last biggest jump and proper interesting console generation. 
Of course, there's so many other games out there as well, with the likes of, obviously, Metal Gear Solid 3, the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series, granted they started on the previous gen, but they did improve and move forward on this one, Kingdom Hearts, the fucking amazing Persona series. It's easy to see why the PlayStation 2 is the king when it comes to console sales to this day. And that's not even to mention one other point, a big boon in the PlayStation 2's life cycle, which Sony actually adopted for the PS3 years later, was at the time, technology was still pretty new, at least the technology for DVD was still pretty new, meaning DVD players were fairly expensive at the time. If you bought a standalone DVD player, you'd probably be playing in around, if not more, than the likes of a PS2. So Sony's option was an affordable way, I say relatively affordable of course, because you're getting a PS2 as a game console, as well as a DVD player, all in one unit for a relatively comparable price as just a quality DVD player. And that was a big deal for all that too. There's also one other thing that's very, very important to mention as it's the only platform in this era to actually do the next thing I'm about to mention. And that was include backwards compatibility. That's right, every single PlayStation 1 game would work on PS2. That was a big deal. No console beforehand had proper native backwards compatibility. That's right, I threw native in there because we all know there was adapters and whatnot that you could get for, say, the likes of the Sega Mega Drive and all that. But this was 100% native. Sony built this in. Unfortunately, this is something that has fallen by the wayside when it comes to Sony nowadays. But it's a shame that something that was so ingrained into Sony and their individuality that they had with the PS2 and even early in the PS3 has now completely fallen apart. The current iteration of backwards compatibility, if you'd even call it that, in modern Sony is absolutely terrible. However, that wasn't always the case. Now, let me get to my experience. I realize I've talked way, way, way too much about this, but hell, I said at the start of this video, this was gonna be a long, passionate filled video because this is what I consider truly the last great console generation and definitely the most interesting. So the PS2 came out just before Christmas here in Europe. Again, I wasn't able to get my hands on one at that point, but I did manage to get it a little bit after Christmas when the stocks replenished. However, a friend of mine, Sean, managed to get a PlayStation 2 for Christmas and he got every single game available. And that's how I got to experience and play Metal Gear Solid 2 at its demo. I mean, some of the other stuff was great. It was a big step forward and the graphics were great and whatnot on all his other games that he had got. But I knew Metal Gear Solid. I loved Metal Gear Solid. And I got to play Metal Gear Solid 2. I played that demo. Hell, I still have that original demo that came with Zone of the Enders. And that impressed me so much that actually the point where I got my PS2 was earlier than I originally planned because I wanted to play that demo over and over and over and over and over. Now, it turned out that Zone of the Enders was a good game anyway, but I bought my PS2 months in advance just to keep replaying that demo. And of course, going forward, there was so much else going for the PS2. I've already mentioned most of them in this video as it was. Final Fantasy X, I put over 150 hours into. And the sixth console gen, especially the PS2, was the last proper console generation that had fully high quality, extremely high quality niche JRPG titles from both high, medium, and low-end company. Final Fantasy, I've already mentioned. The absolutely amazing Persona series. Even some of the smaller ones as well. You had games like Grandia 2. I realized that was a multi-platform game, but it was still on there. And the fantastic Shadow Hearts series. Or at least the first two games are amazing. The third one wasn't that good from what I remember. It's kind of a shame that we haven't seen something since then in that series. But there's so many other ones out there as well, not even just role-playing games. Oh, speaking of which, I should also mention Kingdom Hearts. But there's so many games in all the different genres that kept me going over all those times. I remember just off the top of my head, I'll give an example of some of the times and whatnot and some of the memories I have for the PS2. Time Splitters was such a big deal and such a good game that I remember that a friend of mine and I, we would sit there, we would design our own levels because those games had custom level editors and one. We would crank the difficulty all the way up and we would turn the bot count to max and we'd be gunning down 300 enemies in like 10 minutes because of the insanity that we were doing in that stuff. And that happened over and over and over and over. And fuck it, we'll give one more example of top quality memories and nostalgia. I still remember when I got Silent Hill 2 for Christmas. I got a stack of PS2 games for that Christmas, including the limited edition or special edition, whatever it was called, the cardboard sleeve one with the extra bonus DVD. But I found them a little bit in advance. 
and I snuck out to play Silent Hill 2. The game of course blew my mind, it was absolutely amazing, still is, but I loved it so much that I actually watched the behind the scenes bonus DVD, and that's something I do not do lightly. Probably still the last making of or behind the scenes DVD I've ever watched, even to this day. I still remember so much of what was put into that. From the depiction of the enemies reflecting James' psyche at some point, to even the little story about when one of the enemy designers was completely stumped on an enemy to add. And then, that night, in the office, while he was completely stumped, it was a cold, rainy night in Japan, one of the other developers actually showed up, soaking wet, in a hoodie, with his hands both in the pockets, and the drawstrings around the hood pulled completely tight, only revealing his eyes. And that, of course, gave him the idea for the infamous enemy design of the most common one in the entire game, including the legendary first enemy encounter in the game. So you can see why the PS2 is an absolute big deal. Anyway, before we get on to the rest of the video, of course, I will say that towards the end, we'll go in and give the whole detail how I survived it and whatnot, just like in the previous videos. But before then, we'll move on to the GameCube. So, the Nintendo GameCube, this one is a very interesting console by Nintendo standards because in some ways it actually showed that they learned from their mistakes via the N64 with its problems and whatnot. Although, when you look at it, the N64 was more powerful than the PlayStation, it just had other problems. One of the main ones was how everything was handled with the storage media, the cartridges back on the N64 versus the CDs of the Sega Saturn and the PlayStation 1. This was kind of rectified to an extent in this generation with the GameCube, because yes, while the Nintendo GameCube was of similar power to its competitors, the Dreamcast, the PS2, and even to an extent the OG Xbox, one of its main shortcomings was the storage media, something that Nintendo still can't really get right to this day. But when you look at it, in comparison to everything else, we had the GameCube using mini DVDs, otherwise known as DVD-1s, which store 1.2 gigabytes of data per disc. By comparison, you had the Sega Dreamcast, which used GD-ROMs and CD-ROMs, which were up to one gigabyte, and the PlayStation 2 and OG Xbox used DVDs, which we all know could go up to Dual Layer, which is a DVD-9 of 8.5 gigabytes. And even by comparison, a standard DVD is 4.5 gigabytes. So even a standard DVD was considerably bigger than what the GameCube could offer. This is evidenced by most big games on the GameCube being two discs. The Resident Evil remake, Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil Zero, the awful rendition of Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. A lot of these bigger games were two disc games. And this provided a problem in essence, because it meant when games came to say the PS2 and the OG Xbox, they may not have wanted to compress them, to downgrade them, or it just may not have been possible at all to put them onto those discs, even if they used two of them. But despite that major shortcoming, the storage media side of it, the GameCube was actually a pretty damn good console. When you look at it, it had good third party support, at least by Nintendo standards, because it was very comparable in power to everything else. We had companies using the GameCube as well as other platforms to give them proper exclusive games, exclusive proper entries in series that were important as the next step. I've already mentioned it earlier on in the video, but we had the likes of the Dreamcast getting Resident Evil Code Veronica, and the GameCube not only getting the remake of Resident Evil, but also the prequel, Resident Evil Zero, and the proper sequel, which at that point was Resident Evil 4. Of course, that's not including the ports of Resident Evil 2 and 3 and whatnot which are actually kind of the definitive editions, if you will, because they're obviously better than the PS1, Sega Saturn, N64, and even Dreamcast ports. But let's move away from that side of it for a second, and let's talk about one of the reasons why the GameCube specifically was a very, very interesting console. Now, just like the N64, it had four built-in controller ports, also like the Dreamcast and also like the OG Xbox. In fact, the only console of this generation that didn't have them natively was the PS2. I realize you could get the multi-tap adapter, but this worked in favor for the other three consoles. But the very, very interesting thing about the GameCube was just how many peripherals and upgrades there was. Now, I realize there were peripherals, there were upgrades, there were all sorts of other things for all the consoles of this generation. The PS2 the GameCube, the Xbox, and the Dreamcast. But it always felt like the GameCube ones were a little bit above. It always felt like they were a little bit crazier and a little bit, I don't know what the word to use is, but a little bit more out there. And I've already mentioned previously that the likes of the Sega Dreamcast had a built-in modem, 
as did the OG Xbox. You could buy an external peripheral if you had a PS2, or eventually when they revised it, it actually became built into the console. But the GameCube, you could buy, again, an external adapter. And this would slot into a compartment right on the bottom, so it would be completely flush. You could get either the dial-up modem version, or you could get the broadband modem version. Me, personally, I have both, because originally when the GameCube came out, we didn't have broadband internet here. There was no DSL, there was no cable, there was no fiber, there was no anything. We just had 56k. Now eventually we did get broadband and I eventually got the modem for that and it was so much better. But that's just one example, or two examples if you want to say. Another big notable one when it came to the likes of the GameCube with weird external adapters and all and whatnot was the Game Boy Advance player. That's right, the GBA player. It would slot into a different compartment on the bottom of the GameCube which, by the way, could still be used with the modem and all as well, still in it. And you could play Game Boy Advance games through your GameCube onto your TV. And that was a pretty big deal back when we were still playing in the likes of the CRT days. Standard def all the way. Now there was so much more as well when it came to accessories for the GameCube. I'm not going to get into all of them because I'll be here and this video is going to be about four times longer if I do that. And it's already long enough as it is. But just to give you a quick comparison, in my GameCube right now, I have my GBA player, I have my broadband modem, I even have a portable LCD screen, and my WaveBird adapter. That's right, the WaveBird adapter. That was a wireless controller from Nintendo way back in the GameCube days. But now that we've talked enough about the peripherals and accessories, let's talk about the game. Because really, that's what's important. The games are what make the consoles, essentially. And the GameCube being a Nintendo console, you have one thing always to expect and because of the era and the generation there was so much you could expect elsewhere too so first party stuff with the gamecube obviously it being a nintendo platform you had many many high quality first party titles you had metroid prime 1 and 2 legend of zelda wind waker legend of zelda twilight princess mario kart mario sunshine luigi's mansion the list goes on and like I mentioned previously, you had a lot of stuff from third parties as well. We've already covered what Capcom put on there when it came to Resident Evil. An exclusive remake, an exclusive prequel, ports of Resident Evil 2 and 3, and an exclusive next entry in the series. And even the previously exclusive Resident Evil Code Veronica, when it was actually ported to the other platforms like the PS2, the GameCube got a version of it as well. So when you think about it, the GameCube was basically the place to go when it came to Resident Evil in that generation. That is definitely something you cannot say about a Nintendo platform and pretty much any third party franchise anymore. So you can see why it's so interesting that all these different platforms would have stuff like that. Another interesting side note I always like to bring up as well when talking about third party support and third party games on the GameCube. One thing I've always noticed is that after Sega's demise, which yes happened during this generation, once Sega actually officially stopped supporting the Dreamcast and they went to a third party publishing company, you find that a lot of good GameCube games were actually previously Sega or Dreamcast game. One of the best RPGs on the platform, Skies of Arcadia Legends, is an enhanced port of Skies of Arcadia from the Dreamcast. One of the games I would love to see get a HD remaster, be it on modern platforms or PC. But there were so many other good ones out there as well. From the first party stuff, to the multiplats, or to the third party exclusive. And not only that, but there's a specific Sega game, which is why I brought up the whole enhanced port a second ago, which kind of defined the GameCube to me. Now I'm not talking the usual suspects. Sure, I remember putting so much time into Luigi's Mansion, into Super Mario Sunshine, into the Zelda game, into so much other stuff on there. Some Baldur's Gate games of that era on the PS2, OG Xbox, and the GameCube. Fantastic games, especially with the multiplayer capabilities of up to four players on pretty much everything except the PS2 version. So I can still remember putting so much time, so much effort, so much energy, so many memories with all my friends playing those games. And not to mention, of course, the single player experiences, both first and third party. But what really defined the GameCube to me personally was a Sega game that was eventually ported to the GameCube, as well as the OG Xbox, but my experiences with the GameCube version. You may have heard of it. It's a little game called Fantasy Star Online. Now I was aware that Fantasy Star Online was on the Sega Dreamcast, but I could never get my hands on a copy back in the day. A friend of mine had a copy, but I didn't kind of know him until later in that generation. It's actually the guy with the Shenmue story that I talked about earlier. And I never got a chance to play it until it came out on the GameCube. I was super hyped for it, was absolutely could not wait. 
And I will basically credit that game, Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2, on the GameCube, as my first proper MMO, because I put a lot of time into that, both online and off. Of course, it's very basic by modern MMO standards, or even PC MMO standards of the time. But that game opened up a huge world of gameplay and RPG style elements to me at the time. To be able to play all that online, sure, of course, the servers were hacked to bits. You'd go online and everyone would be giving you every type of item and every type of maxed everything just because they could hack them. You didn't care. This was new. This was interesting. This was badass and beast mode. And I put so, so, so much time into that. Again, online and offline. Even to the point where I was unfortunately struck by a common glitch. One of the two most common glitches, actually. There was one called the Frozen Screen of Doom. Or the Frozen Screen of Death. Based on the whole Windows BSOD thing. And what would happen is sometimes when logging into the game or whatnot, usually only applied when you were going online, the game would freeze up and your console would lock up essentially. You'd have to reset it or turn it off. But that was all good. But there was another version of it. There was the FSODX, which was the Frozen Screen of Doom Extreme. This one was the killer. This one happened pretty much the exact same way as the regular FSOD, but it happened at the most inopportune moment. It happened while you were still auto-saving when loading in. And we all know what happens when something crashes or power is turned off or storage is removed or whatever while saving data. That's right, it would completely corrupt your entire Fantasy Star file. I still remember being in the 120-ish level range because I had finally logged on to be able to do a specific level or a specific area on a specific difficulty. It was actually the kind of greenhouse slash botanical gardens area in Fantasy Star Online Episode 2. How I remember this is insane. And I remember I had just hit the level to be able to go to the next, the next difficulty of it. So I logged in and boom, FSODX. Completely corrupted and erased my save file. Had to start over from scratch. Ended up getting much, much further, putting much, much more time into it as well. And getting to a much higher level. Absolutely so, so, so good. And despite so many things, both single player, multiplayer, first party, third party, exclusive, whatever... Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 is really what defined the GameCube for me. Hell, I even bought a separate keyboard specifically designed to come with an adapter to plug into the GameCube so you could properly chat. There were all sorts of custom emojis and custom kind of macros and stuff you could make for chat, but with the keyboard, that really wasn't a problem. Hori actually made a keyboard that was built into the middle of the controller with a full-size GameCube controller with a keyboard built in the middle, usually specifically designed for that. Always wanted to pick one up, but never actually got around to it. But that's pretty much it for the GameCube in my experience. Like I said, we all did have GameCubes, me and all my friends, we swapped a lot of games. There wasn't too many games between us at the time. But hell, now that I think about it, I usually end each little individual section with a kind of, let's call it anecdote and experience from, from whatever it is. Let's go with this one, because this is always a really funny one. So I already mentioned Skies of Arcadia Legends. I knew this game was coming out, but we didn't have anywhere in my town at the time to buy new games. So I was going up to Dublin by myself, because, well, you know, I'm, I wasn't a child. And I was looking to get a copy of that. So I went up. And while I was on the way up there, on the train up there, I actually ran into a friend of mine. I've already mentioned him in previous versions of these videos. He was the one who had, say, a Super Nintendo and his brothers had the Mega Drive. Or him and his brothers had all the PlayStation. I actually ran into him. So we hung out. We shot the shit all the day up in Dublin with each other. He came with me as I went and bought the games and whatnot. And he was actually up there to go to an audition for a TV show. Now, he's not an actor or anything like this. We were, we were a bit younger. We were still in our teens. So he was doing whatnot and all that. I was like, you know what? I'll tag along with you because I figured I just, I could stand outside or just stand in a room while he's doing whatever anyway. So once we get to that audition, there's hundreds of people there. It, it's trailing out the building completely. Eventually, we get into a room where he has to do the audition. It was very different from what I expected. I thought it would be two or three people sitting at a table while he was reading one or two lines. Now, I only found this out later, but it was actually uh, auditions for extras for a TV show. It was a medieval-style TV show. But here's the funny thing. At one point, because I was with him as well, it was kind of a group deal. So what they did was they had about 10 people line up all at once, all side to side to side to side, and stand forward for a kind of a... A screen test kind of thing, if you will. And just for the just for the hell of it, I decided, you know what? 
I'll do this with you because I figured we'd just be doing like a pose or something like that. It'd be kind of funny. So I stood there with him. And then, of course, what happens is there's a countdown. And we're not told what's going to happen at that. We're just told to stand still, let whatever happens happen. There will be a picture taken and it will be done. So we're standing there anyway. And then there's the countdown. We're seeing it, the big number on the wall. It's counting down. It hits zero. There's a small alarm or more of a bell or a buzzer. And then suddenly... There's a row of girls behind us, a row of women, whatever, and they just completely pull our tops off over our heads. Now, I was still a teenager at the time, so I was like some little skinny, wiry dude. I didn't have any muscle or anything on me at the time. I didn't know what was going on. And then the picture was taken and we were given our tops back and, and on the way out, someone asked, it's like, what's the deal with this? Why do we have to do this and all? And one of the people, the producers or the casting director or whoever it was that was there actually said, oh, this is for such and such. It's a medieval TV show and whatnot. And we're looking for extras on battlefields. So obviously they're looking for big buff dudes. And, you know, me and my friend here were wiry little teenagers with like no muscle on us whatsoever. Just, just kind of funny. It's still, it's still in my mind to this day. It's not traumatic or anything. I just think it's kind of funny that something like that would randomly, accidentally happen. And because it happened on the day I got Skies of Arcadia Legends, it's always intrinsically linked to that game for me. If I think about memories for that game, I'll think, sure, I'll think about the quality of the game, how fantastic it is, over time, how much I spent talking and playing with my friends with it. But I'll always remember that story as well. Anyway, that's enough for the Nintendo GameCube. We'll move on to the new competitor, the big black behemoth, and Microsoft's first foray into the console market with the OG original Xbox 180. Whatever name you knew it by, Microsoft's first console and her first foray into the market actually went pretty damn well, to the point where they actually came in second in that console era, beating out veterans like Nintendo and Sega. Granted, they didn't come close to the monumental and record-breaking sales of the PS2, but Microsoft's Xbox went on to become the second best-selling platform. They used all their history and all their experience with their Microsoft as a brand and the Windows company, as well as the knowledge of hardware and how that all went to develop a seriously powerful console for what was available by the competition. By comparison, you had the Dreamcast, which was kind of the entry level of the current four platforms. And then you had the PS2 and GameCube, which were kind of the same. They had a little bit of one up here and one up there over the other. And then there was a significant leap between that and the OG Xbox, which is why generally original Xbox games, specifically ones that are exclusive or first party, were significantly better looking. But overall, the multiplats were generally roughly the same. Like the whole thing when you compare nowadays with an Xbox One game and a PS4 game. Very, very similar. But this console, which funny enough was originally codenamed the Direct Xbox, we all know what Direct X is because, well, essentially, the Xbox is like a kind of mini PC. It was using proper PC hardware for back in the day, which is why it was considerably more powerful. And Microsoft took a lot from all the previous generations, from all the other manufacturers, and they put a lot of thought and effort into the Xbox, and they got some of the best stuff from some of the other consoles. Microsoft naturally being a big online focused company, even back then actually built it in with the, the network adapter directly into the console. Granted, the Dreamcast also did this. Microsoft did it with a broadband network adapter, an actual LAN port. Four built-in controller ports, just like some of the other consoles of this and the previous generation. DVD media, allowing bigger storage, just like the PS2. And in order to keep cost-cutting measures down to get the actual box out there, DVD functionality and playback for regular DVD movies was actually put off to a separate standalone package you could buy. It came with the DVD remote and a receiver for it, and that enabled the feature on the actual console. The big thing, though, with the Xbox was the game, just like any other platform should be. There's also one other big thing that is fairly influential and landmark when it comes to the OG Xbox, which we'll get to now in a minute. But before we do all that, of course, it's vital we talk about the game. Because the Xbox was actually using PC-based hardware, the games were actually fairly easy to port over and code for, which was a very attractive prospect for many of developers. When you look at almost every single console up to the PS4 and Xbox One, almost every console was very different architecture. Porting and coding, optimizing and developing and whatnot was a very different story back then. 
we'll touch on it a lot more in the next video we're going to do on this when it comes to the seven console generation because of the 360 and ps3 but you can see why the xbox was an attractive package for develop more power a quality feature set of both hardware and software and an easy to develop for architecture. So because of all of that, you had a large range of third party support coming over from the other consoles, from the existing consoles already. The PS2, the GameCube, the Dreamcast, these were getting games that were ported from those platforms onto the Xbox. And of course, because of the extra power and all available, usually they would either look, perform, or both better on the Xbox. And these were some pretty big games as well. We're not just talking old ports and niche stuff. You had games like Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance that was ported to the Xbox. You even had games like the Grand Theft Auto Trilogy, which, of course, back in that day, GTA 3, Vice City, San Andreas, those games blew the world apart with just how crazy and insane they were in the best possible ways. Hell, to this day, most people still classify one of those three GTA games as the best GTA game. Personally, for me, it's a bit of a toss-up between GTA 3 and San Andreas. Of course, San Andreas being the better game overall. But I just have so much nostalgia for not only all three of the games, but GTA 3. Even if the majority of my playtime of it was on the PS2. And speaking of which, when it comes to the GTA games, that's where a brilliant new feature of the Xbox that wasn't on any of the other previous consoles actually came in handy. One of the features and abilities of the Xbox was the fact that you could put in a music CD and rip it directly to the 8GB internal hard drive. Now, it's not the first console to actually use an internal hard drive. The PS2 had an optional extra you could buy, which was pretty much only used for installing Final Fantasy XI, that I'm aware of at least. But, because of all this music you could store on your hard drive on the OG Xbox, many games would actually incorporate this function and feature into the game. GTA games, you could use custom soundtracks on consoles. So you could curate your own radio station, if you will. We all know GTA is kind of famous for its radio. And you could have your own one just for that. So many games did this, but just another quick example is WWF Raw. When you were customizing your whole character's intro under Titantron and all that, you could even use your own custom entrance music. Hell, I still remember creating my one. My custom character entered the Still Dre. And when you coupled all of that together, you were in for a damn good time. So let's get back to the games for a second. We already talked about some of it so far, mainly the multiplats. The attractive proposition of actually bringing them over in multiple different ways and reasons. But let's look at a couple of other ones. I want to break this down into two more separate groups when it comes to the games available on the OG Xbox 180. Now we're gonna leave the exclusive first party title to last because that's the obvious one. But another key thing when it came to the Xbox and the titles available for it, specifically more exclusive ones, because of the power that was available on the console, you could get more PC-like game, games that were previously only available on PC or their counterparts available on PC that would not be able to run on a PS2, a Dreamcast, or a GameCube, but could be modified or cut down in some way and could actually run on the OG Xbox. So there was a whole new market being made available just for the OG Xbox when it came to the console space. And that was a big deal. You had lots of other series, genres, publishers, developers, now able to make games of an adequate quality and performance on a console, which made the Xbox even more attractive to potential buyers, myself included. And that, of course, brings us to the first party titles. We all know that back in the Xbox days, the OG Xbox, as well as the Xbox 360, Microsoft were known for the first party titles. Even if it wasn't my cup of tea, Fable was one of the big ones, of course. It was a pretty famous series. And one that I absolutely do love and have a serious investment with, of course, the infamous, legendary Halo series. Using the power of the OG Xbox, which again was not available on any of the other platforms, Microsoft managed to pull off one of the best looking first person shooter games of that era, at least when it came to console. And not only did it look great and have all these new fantastic effects that were very, very, very rarely or even never seen beforehand, at least on console, Halo went on to have its own legacy still going to this day with the upcoming title Halo Infinite and everything in between. Of course, there were far more first party exclusive games than just these ones we've mentioned. But really, when you think about it, what can compare to Halo? Another little interesting fun fact, Splinter Cell actually started as an Xbox exclusive game. The first game was so graphically intensive at the time that only the Xbox 180 could properly present it on console. 
and I'm sure I don't need to remind you, the graphics in that game, the lighting effects, the shadows and whatnot, were unbelievable at the time. Kind of weird when you think about it. A great series from Ubisoft. Then again, this was back when Ubisoft probably still gave a shit. But Splinter Cell would go on to have four great games in the entire series before completely shitting itself. Now, back to some of the important ones that we want to talk about. We've already mentioned the first party games. We've mentioned the superior multiplats. And we've mentioned the exclusive third party games allowed on the console because of the power and performance. And when you take all of these three games, all of these three types of games, including ones that we've talked about with the likes of maybe Halo, Splinter Cell, and even more, and you couple that with Microsoft's innate desire to bring online gaming to consoles by building it natively into the feature set of the console hardware, it would be completely irresponsible of me not to talk about Xbox Live. Xbox Live completely revolutionized and changed the face of gaming online on console. Yes, there was online gaming on console before that. They had it on the Dreamcast. They had it on the PS2. They had it on the GameCube. But Xbox Live completely pushed the envelope forward. That completely revolutionized everything in that regard when it came to online gaming on console. From power, performance, servers, voice chat, even how it operated stuff like friends list and invites. Xbox Live did it right properly from day one. Hell, to this day, almost two decades later, there are currently companies who have put out online services that are not up to par feature set wise and quality set wise as the original Xbox was nearly 20 years ago. Services that don't have dedicated servers, servers that don't have dedicated voice chat, messaging systems, proper online friends list, whatever. These still exist. These still exist as problems in current year for certain companies. But Microsoft, they said no. Back in the early 2000s, they did everything right. And it paid off handsomely. We all know the legacy of Halo. And of course, the legacy of Halo would be absolutely nothing if I didn't mention Halo 2. Because Halo 2 completely changed the face of online. You couple Halo 2 with Xbox Live, the rest is history. I can't even begin to count how many hours, how much time, how many matches, how much everything I've spent online on Halo 2 back on the OG Xbox. It's the same with Splinter Cell. We mentioned that as well. Some of the Splinter Cell games had online multiplayer. You had Spies versus Mercs. And those were fantastic games. It was all so good. In part, of course, thanks to Microsoft and the dedicated servers and the quality of Xbox Live and its infrastructure. I know when the Xbox came out and then all the games started getting ported over and they ran and looked better, especially ones that now would run online and play properly online, not to mention the exclusive first party and PC style games ported over only on the Xbox. I had pretty much moved over to the Xbox at that point because of all those reasons. Coupled with the fact that stuff like Rainbow Six Tree which was a big, big, big deal for me. Splinter Cell and even Halo 2, among others, were all I pretty much played at the time. And speaking of Rainbow Six Tree, we'll go in with my little personal story. Rainbow Six Tree was actually the game that got me properly into online gaming on console, with the exception of MMOs and whatnot. Like I said, I played stuff like Final Fantasy XI and Fantasy Star and whatnot, but I played the demo, that's right, a playable demo, on a demo disc from a magazine of Rainbow Six Tree. That game was so, so, so damn good that when it finally came out, I bought the shit out of that game. I started playing the shit out of that game and then I found out there was an online service. You could play online using those style games, those style levels, the missions, whatever, with other people. I still remember the night I signed up for Xbox Live first. A friend of mine, the guy from the Shenmue video, or the Shenmue story, I should say, from the Sega part of this video, he was here with me, and he, as a fellow Rainbow Six Tree lover, saw just how crazy that was to be able to do it, the quality of it, and we all know what that led to over the course of the next, well, up until current day and beyond. And of course, naturally, with the progression of technology and online service and all offered by Xbox Live, it actually made Sony step up and beef up what they could offer with the PlayStation Network. Nintendo didn't really do anything and Sega was out of the game at that point. But I've always said the competition breeds innovation. And that is a perfect example. So that one will function as my little anecdote for the end of the Xbox section. Because between me and all my other friends getting Xboxes, playing games on them, rebuying everything, using that as our almost primary platform going forward, that was a big deal. 
Anyway, we've suffered through this video long enough. Like I said earlier, this is definitely the last truly innovative and interesting console generation for many reasons explained in this video. And that's why this video is so long. I have so much love, so much passion, so much everything for all four of the platforms and everything they could do, everything they couldn't do, everything they did and everything they tried, everything that left a lasting impression and everything that crashed and burned and went down in flames. Looking at you, Sega's hardware division. Anyway, so where did this leave me and what did I stick with, if you will, when it came to this console generation? Well, like I mentioned in the video, I did own all four consoles, played all four consoles and had a serious proper investment in all four consoles. But I have to say, without a doubt, the PS2, probably like 150 million other people out there, ruled that console generation for me. Dozens of Dreamcast games, dozens of GameCube games, dozens of OG Xbox games, hundreds if not thousands of hours put into those three consoles as well. But at the end of the day, they couldn't touch the PlayStation 2. And that is how I survived the sixth console generation. I want to thank everyone for tuning into this video, especially because it's been exceptionally long. I get a little bit ranty and rambly when I'm talking about something that I'm so passionate about, as I'm sure you're already aware. So I want to say an extra special thank you for putting up with me in this video. Luckily, the last two remaining videos in this series for the seventh and eighth console generation will be nowhere near as long, nowhere near as interesting, and there's a lot less to talk about. So before we end up real quick, I will just as always say one more super special thank you for putting up with this video. Maybe you have a similar story, maybe you have a similar situation, or maybe it's completely different for you. Either way, thank you for watching, and we'll see the next video on how I survived the seventh console generation.